It's a pleasure to be here in front of the ETPN uh, to present some of the work that we've done for uh, nanotechnology and specifically for Abraxane. I realize this title may be somewhat challenging as the first approved nanotherapeutic, but nevertheless, uh, that can be debated. Uh, it's, uh, again, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, today, I would like to talk to you about Abraxane and the technology that we developed. So it'll be somewhat of a technical presentation, but also I'd like to give some idea of uh, the hurdles and opportunities that we faced in getting the product approved. So this is a, a long process of starting from uh, initial innovation in the laboratory leading all the way to the market, which takes maybe 15 years or so. Uh, and so I hope to give you some of the, the I wouldn't say guidelines, but some of the experiences along the way, and ultimately show you how it benefits to the patient. So as far as the technology, this is based on, uh, on albumin, which is a human protein, and an insoluble drug. In the case of paclitaxel, it's uh, uh, this type of nanoparticle that we create, and the nanoparticle is coated with the protein albumin. It's about 100 nanometer in size. And uh, the basic technology revolves around the unique aspects of the protein albumin, which can uh, have some unique transport capabilities in the body. Uh, and I will mention those as we go along in the talk. And it can bind to specific receptors and therefore have specific effect in tumors. Uh, Braxane is now approved in uh, 42 countries worldwide, including the EU, uh, for the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. And it was approved in uh, the United States first in 2005, and then later in Europe in 2008. Albumin itself is a very interesting molecule. Um, most people do not regard this as a very useful molecule because it's present in a large excess in our bodies. It's the most prevalent protein. Uh, but if you really study albumin, you see it has some unique functions. And those unique functions include transport of very important uh, nutrients, which is fatty acids, hormones, vitamins, all of the things that are needed by our body to grow. And in fact, all of the things that are needed for tumors to grow. Uh, it also binds a specific receptor on endothelial cells, which is called the GP60 receptor, and it binds some proteins called SPARC, which is secreted by tumor cells. And therefore, we can leverage these capabilities of albumin to send drugs to the tumor. Now, as far as uh, getting from bench to the clinic, uh, it's, of course, a long process, and there's many hurdles, but also many opportunities along the way. And it's important to recognize those. Um, sometimes, uh, or many times, I say you learn by your mistakes, especially when there's not many people in front of you to learn from. So we've been through this process. And uh, what I hope to do, at least in a very superficial way today, is to uh, give some of this information uh, that hopefully will help the European uh, innovation in nanotechnology. So I think the first point is, uh, was raised by some of the previous speakers is that nanotechnology or nanomedicine, uh, so what is the nano part of the equation? It's really an enabling technology. It's not a product in itself. It's really how you impart some unique properties to maybe existing molecules so that you can ultimately better serve the patients who need them. And this is very important to recognize because it's uh, in order to work towards a product, to develop a product, it's important to use the technology, not nano for the sake of nano, but nano for the sake of some improvement or benefit to the patient. There's a number of uh, things that you need to do in order to get a product approved of course, is look at uh, very carefully at product characterization. Manufacturing is, brings lots of chal challenges for these unique uh, nanomedicine type products. Uh, you, of course, have to go through the regulatory hurdles, uh, preclinical testing, 
and then of course clinical testing in patients and uh, also this uni opens up some unique opportunities for personalized medicine. But really the, the big question should be if you start a program in nanomedicine is that is the technology really enabling for the product. So in thinking about this when we first started on this program in about 1992 or 1993, many years ago, uh, we looked at the problem, an existing problem that was uh, present at the time. And there was a new drug at the time called Taxol, which is now an old drug. But at the time, it was a phenomenal drug. It still is a very good drug for treatment of cancer. But uh, there was lots of challenges in trying to get that drug approved and into the clinic and into the, uh, into the patients and onto the market. And one of those was because of its insolubility, there was uh, a need to uh, solubilize the drug for intravenous administration. And this required the use of certain solvents, which are, uh, for example, cremophore and ethanol. But the basic problem was that these solvents that are used for administration cause very serious and fatal hypersensitivity type reactions in the patient. And so that many patients died in the early days uh, when the drug was administered and it wasn't very clear to the clinicians how to best administer this drug. So that was the unmet need that we went after. We looked at this problem and we said, how can we better deliver this drug and get it into the patient and get it to the tumor to make it more effective and more importantly, more safe. So we looked at, we thought of natural pathways, we thought of many different approaches, but ultimately we decided on the use of albumin, which is a biocompatible protein that's in our blood and in our bodies, and uh, decided to try and use that. And that's really the genesis of the idea behind the Braxane. Uh, so, as we developed this, what we found was in the first versions of Abraxane, when we tested it in animals, we could see the difference between Abraxane and Taxol in terms of the toxicity. So even in the mice studies that we did, we had a dramatically reduced toxicity compared to, uh, compared to Taxol, and we could administer a much larger amount of the drug into mice without the mice dying of anaphylactic reactions. And similarly, when we first went to, into human clinical trials, we saw the same effect. So we could effectively deliver much larger doses uh, than the standard drug Taxol. Even as late as 2009, this paper was published last year. And uh, this was done by researchers who scanned the databases of different regulatory bodies, including the FDA, uh, the European agency and the Japanese agency to look for adverse event reports or serious adverse event reports. And they found in total uh, 287 reports of serious adverse events that were reported to these agencies. And from those 287, they found that almost 40% of patients that were in that, those reports actually died because of administration of the drug. Not because of their cancer, but because of administration of the drug. And this is remarkable, and this is only, this is in a 10 year period from 1997 to 2007. What we should also think about is that these are only the, the cases that were reported. There's probably a vast majority of them which are not reported, because in many places there are not very strict reporting guidelines. What was even more important was that 22% of them, these patients who experienced the fatal reactions, uh, died because of, uh, or in spite of taking pre-medication, which is used for administration of Taxol, to prevent these reactions. So in spite of the pre-medication, these patients experienced very, very serious complications or a fatal reaction. So this, is, uh, this occurs even today. So we're, uh, by going into using a different technology or different delivery system, we profoundly affecting uh, potentially the lives of people and patients. 
As far as characterization of Abraxane, uh, this is a complex nanotechnology product. And as I think all of you in the room recognize that most nanotechnology products are complex. They're not like conventional uh, drug molecules. They're usually some sort of three-dimensional constructs that are put together with multiple components. And because of that, you require more complex characterization techniques to fully understand what these constructs are all about. And this is just a list of some of them. By no means is it this a complete list, or no means is this a strict guidance of the type of characterization you need to do. That should be specific to each product. And here you can see some pictures of Abraxane. These are nanoparticles and spherical nanoparticles uh, using electron microscopy techniques and also light scattering techniques. As far as manufacturing, uh, clearly manufacturing of these complex products presents uh, substantial hurdles as compared to standard uh, manufacturing of conventional drugs. So the folks are, who are in this business of developing nanotechnology have to think about new techniques to make these products uh, that may not exist. So you, there is real innovation behind this in the processes leading to nanotechnology products. Of course, this is uh, described as a very simple technique, but in reality, it's multi-step and complex procedure that ultimately leads to these nanoparticles. And as I mentioned, you would expect to have in these manufacturing techniques uh, non-standard equipment. There you'd experience many challenges, as I'm sure some of the people in this room may have already experienced. But the key issues that regulatory agencies will look for around the world is the ability to consistently and reproducibly manufacture your product. And what that means is defined by the characteristics you set that you feel are important for the product. Again, there's no strict guidelines. If size is a key issue for the function of the nanotechnology product, then you must be able to produce this with a, reprodu a reproducible size. So it's very important to work with the different regulatory agencies, the FDA, the uh, EMEA, Kiko in Japan, or wherever uh, you pursue these technologies to enable the understanding to the regulatory agencies. Because this is a new field. Uh, you cannot assume that the regulatory agencies will understand your product. Uh, you have to explain the function, the structure, the relationships uh, to these agencies. And for the most part, they are scientifically driven, so that's the good uh, side of it. Uh, you will, of course, get some questions that may be at a tangent or you cannot uh, un comprehend the nature of the question, but again, it's a matter of making them understand. So in general, all of our experiences have been quite positive. Uh, as far as dealing with some of the regulatory aspects, um, most nanotherapeutics, as I mentioned, are likely to be complex. They may be involving small molecule drugs, uh, polynucleotides, polymeric excipients, different targeting moieties, peptides, proteins. So they will be complex products. So you will need the appropriate tools to understand these complex products and their morphologies. Uh, the other interesting question that comes up is do you classify these products as drugs or biologics? Because quite often they will have multiple components that are drug small molecules, or they may have a biological components such as targeting moieties and proteins, etc. So that's an interesting question, and uh, some of the agencies across the world are dealing with this in an appropriate way. But, uh, like for example, the FDA has an office of combination products where you can go there and ask them how do you classify such.